Nightwing! <笑>ミスタあなたの覚悟はこの上りゆく朝日よりも明るい輝きで道を照らしているそして我々がこれから向かうべき正しい道をも Legends Arceus is the mainline Pokemon game best known for two things being different in every possible way and people being unable to agree on how to pronounce its name. Instead of the modern day settings of the mainline games where you go through gyms and conquer a league, you instead get Isekai to the ancient past where you join an expedition society, complete the world's first ever Pokedex, get assaulted by wild Pokemon, and eventually fight God. In other words, not too different from your standard JRPG story. That being said, in this world where everything is simultaneously familiar yet brand new, one man pretty much stole the show in the player base's eyes. Volo. While Arceus is officially the game's final boss, people tend to credit the title to Volo instead. And for good reason, Volo is both the primary antagonist and the source of the game's overarching narrative conflict, and the fight against Arceus is more of a victory lap and for the tying up of loose ends. Some people even go so far as to declare Volo to be the greatest battle in any Pokemon game. And while this is a somewhat subjective and hyperbolic opinion, one certainly cannot deny that Volo's battle makes for an epic finale to the overall game. But creating a memorable battle like this involves a lot more than just putting together a powerful team. Creating an experience like this requires a very strong understanding of a Pokemon player's psychology and thinking, built up over the course of not just one game, but across the entire franchise. So, let's take a closer look at Volo and examine how exactly the game's designers made use of a player's psychology and expectations to craft a memorable experience. Before we begin, if you haven't watched my video about Cynthia, I'd personally recommend you go and do so before continuing onwards, because much of the information here will be built on the context established from that video. Think of it as required reading. Now if I had said that the keywords for Cynthia are all about expectations and reinforcement, then I would now say that the keyword for Volo is surprise. Just like Cynthia before him, Volo is all about manipulating expectations. However, the game's designers went about this in a completely different fashion compared to Cynthia. While the experience of Cynthia was all about setting low initial expectations and then excelling, the experience of Volo was more about breaking your expectations instead, giving you absolutely zero expectations from the outset and then breaking everything about your understanding of the story and the game's rules. With Cynthia, there are low initial expectations, but with Volo, there are zero expectations whatsoever. In fact, practically everything about the entire game is used to cultivate that lack of expectation entirely. Everything that makes this fight great is only made possible because of the initial groundwork which the game sets up. Now, I would like to ask a question of you, my dear viewer. First, cast your mind back to the start of the game, to the point where you first started playing Legends Arceus. Take a moment to recall not just Volo, but also everything about the region of Hisui, from the setting, to the characters, to the story, to the battles, to the general experience of playing the game. Think back to everything you did as part of the game's story, everything you were told about the world, and everything you felt as you progressed through the game. Now tell me, do you remember exactly what was the main driving conflict of the game? What was the source of every problem that the game's plot revolved around? I'll give you a few seconds. Pause the video and take a moment to think. You can share your thoughts in the comments if you want, but I'll tell you up front, the answer isn't Volo, and it also isn't Arceus. In fact, it isn't even a single person, Pokemon, or organization at all. It isn't a who, but a what. 
It's that space-time rift. It's what transports you into Hisui. It's the source of the uneasy atmosphere across Jubilai Village. It's the reason why the clan's noble Pokemon have gone berserk. It's the Galaxy Expedition team's main subject of investigation. And its status worsening is what motivates Kamado to banish you from the village. Everything about the plot of the game revolves around that rift. Everybody is either motivated by the threat it poses, is dealing with the noble Pokemon it drove berserk, or is figuring out a plan on how to close it. Everywhere at any time, the rift is visible at all times from any area within the game, hanging in the sky and perpetually existing as a distant yet omnipresent threat. As you explore Hisui and deal with the berserk noble Pokemon, the space-time rift serves as the grander scope threat which the characters have to deal with. There is no evil team, no problem causing Pokemon, and no real antagonist to speak of. The credits even roll upon you successfully closing the rift, signifying that the main conflict of the story has been resolved. By Pokemon game standards, this is highly unusual. Both the mainline and spin-off games typically follow a straightforward format where an evil organization or individual serves as the main antagonist who threatens the player and characters throughout the main story, but not for Legends Arceus. In fact, the game pretty much acts as if there is no main antagonist whatsoever. Now, I am a game designer, which means my knowledge primarily lies in game design. But to explain what is going on here, we will need to talk a bit about literature, which I had fortunately studied at a higher level back during my IB diploma days and even got an English minor in university. So I can give a basic explanation. All narrative conflicts within stories can be categorized into a series of archetypes. Depending on whose chart you reference, the number of these archetypes can range anywhere from from 4 to 6 or 7. More general conflicts include things like man versus self, which refers to a form of internal conflict as the characters struggle to overcome their own personal flaws. No, you're not me! I would never say anything like that ever! And the more specific conflicts include things like man versus fate, which are stories about trying to fight against and overcome a predestined, usually negative, fate. Stories can feature multiple types of narrative conflicts. Pokemon Pokemon stories typically utilize a straightforward man versus man conflict, where the story is primarily driven by another character acting as the main antagonist, typically an evil team leader or a rival. However, Legends Arceus does not. The main story of Legends Arceus is painted as a conflict created by a natural disaster, being the space-time rift, the problems it creates, and the character's attempts to avert it, and the majority of the threats you face in the side quests and across the game world are simply just highly dangerous wild Pokemon. This is a clear man versus nature conflict. This type of conflict was chosen to tell a story of how the relationship between Pokemon and humans were different back in the past. But it also has a secondary, potentially unintended benefit. It deflects attention away from Volo. Tell me, dear viewer, did the plot twist of Volo being the main villain come as a legitimate surprise for you? For some players, Volo's betrayal was an unexpected twist because the entire story was structured as a man versus nature conflict, which went completely resolved without any hint of an actual main antagonist whatsoever. With Cynthia in Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, players already know that every Pokemon game ends with a champion battle and thereby have some baseline expectations regarding that. You just don't know exactly who the champion might be or what their team is like. However, Legends Arceus doesn't have that formula. In fact, according to traditional Pokemon formula, the game's story would already have ended by this point. The credits already rolled after you close the rift, there are no new areas to explore, and Volo's plate search appears more like a post-game after story akin to Aurasa's Delta episode or Looker's stories in almost every game he appears in. 
For the entirety of the story, Volo well and truly is just a traveling merchant with a love for mythology. Sure, he might be Cynthia's ancestor, but practically everybody in this game is somebody else's ancestor. In fact, the merchant guild he works for also includes Volkner's ancestor too. Apparently, the sitting posture is hereditary. So Volo is well and truly nothing special in this regard. The only expectation you might have for Volo is for him to be a bonus super boss or giving you a challenging fight at some point based on Cynthia's own battle, seeing as how he uses a Togepi and a Gibble in his earlier battles. But you have zero rational reason to suspect him of doing anything actually evil because the whole story already came and went without him doing anything. Because of this, Volo was able to establish nigh zero narrative expectations prior to his actual fight, so his eventual betrayal and villainous monologue are able to catch players off guard, to the point where a player might even momentarily forget he's supposed to be based on Cynthia. Then he gives you a reminder. <sighs> okay. Oh, he has six Pokemon. Uh-oh. Oh, that's an insane... Wait. Wait. Uh-oh. Is that piano I hear? Oh my god. Hold up. I wasn't scared until I heard the piano. Okay, wait. Deep breaths. Oh my god, the strings! <laughs> oh no. Oh my god, my PTSD! Wait, he opens with Spiritomb! Is this just Cynthia's team? Do you remember what I mentioned back in Cynthia's video about how her battle makes use of the primacy effect and continuous reinforcement? Well, Volo comes in as the full payoff of that foundation she establishes, with the start of his battle meant to evoke all of those old Cynthia-related memories. What happens here is that the game's designers have manipulated our expectations, moving them from an uncertain zero and locking them into an already known quantifiable high point. Everyone knows that Cynthia is a tough fight, even if you had managed to win on the first attempt. So, by leading with Spiritomb and a remix of Cynthia's piano theme, Volo capitalizes on the ingrained player memories which the primacy effect had helped establish. He immediately communicates to the player that this upcoming battle will be on the same difficulty level as her. As I mentioned back in her video, by the time of the modern day, Cynthia's reputation as one of Pokemon's toughest bosses had now become well established among the player base, especially considering Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl had just released a few months prior to Legends Arceus, and contained one of the most difficult set of Elite Four and Champion battles in the entire series. In a sense, Volo is simultaneously riding off and indirectly contributing towards Cynthia's already well-established reputation. If she didn't exist, this battle wouldn't feel anywhere near as impactful as it is. Volo essentially serves as another surprise Cynthia battle, which has transcended time and space to catch you off guard once again. It's like walking into the Andela Town house all over again. And at this point, the player's thought process can best be described as This is going to suck! Which is a thought process that gets confirmed as the battle progresses. Volo's team is pretty much identical to Cynthia's, with the exception of Melotic being switched out for Hisu and Arcanine, and his team's moves being changed as a result of the game's revised move pools. Compared to every other opponent in the game, Volo is remarkably difficult because he's using Cynthia's naturally powerful team, especially if you are unprepared for him, and that difficulty is a memorable unexpected surprise in and of itself. 
Legends Arceus is, to put simply, not a difficult game. It's extremely fun, sure, but prior to Volo, there should be zero opponents who would realistically have given you trouble. EXP is easily earned via exploring and capturing Pokemon, which the game heavily encourages you to do, and you can easily catch powerful alpha Pokemon, so it is very easy to casually outlevel most opponents. Combined with how few trainer battles there are, and how how none of them use 6 Pokemon, Volo is an unexpectedly big jump in difficulty, and is potentially the first and only opponent in the game which might realistically pose a challenge to the player. In fact, Volo might be the first time that a player will actively go and think about their team composition. Due to the overall low difficulty of Legends Arceus, Pokedex entry is getting failed via using Pokemon instead of just capturing them, EXP being being shared, and switching between multiple teams being easy to do, the player is incentivized to and rewarded for using different Pokemon based on which dex entries require filling instead of building up a team of 6 powerful fighters like in the regular games. Despite the game having a surprisingly deep upgrade system of move and effort customization, all of the battles in this game are just too easy and too infrequent to make a player act actively care enough to build a proper battle team. Players will typically be coasting along with constantly shifting teams of random Pokemon and still be doing fine, sort of like how N makes his own teams on the fly. As a result, it is very realistic for many players to walk into the Volo fight with a team of 6 random unevolved Pokemon, completely under-equipped and unprepared to handle Cynthia's team, and promptly lose as a result, which contributes to building a player's impression of him. Because regardless of whether you felt the loss was deserved or not, you still lost, and for the first time in the game at that. Failure stings. So you take the L for the first time in the whole game, go back, take out a proper team, and return to run it back. Perhaps you lose and try again, or perhaps you win on your next attempt. Doesn't matter, eventually you will win. But Battle Decided hasn't appeared yet. And then this is where the next surprise kicks in. He is surprisingly chill about Satan himself being behind him. Oh look, it's actually Satan. Emphasis on actually. After you defeat Volo's team, he summons Giratina to continue the battle against you. Now, this isn't the first time in the series that something like this has happened. You battled and captured the cover legendary dragon of Black and White 1 prior to the climactic duel against N, and Getsis in Black and White 2 forced you to battle against Kyurem before fighting you directly. However, the difference between these two cases is that N and the legendary dragon, and Getsis and Kyurem are treated as two separate battles positioned back to back meaning you get healed in between the fights, and you only need to refight the second battle in the event that you lose and reset, whereas Volo and Giratina are treated as one single continuous battle, with a cinematic cutscene in between. If you lose to Giratina, you still need to go back all the way through Volo. Before we progress any further, we need to talk about what I call the illusion of fairness. To put simply, many games are not always fair, in the sense that in-game opponents never truly play by the same rules as the human players, despite looking as if they do. And this is done in order to make the gameplay experience function. For instance, player characters and enemies in many RPGs tend to operate under different calculations and mechanics, such as players being able to heal and deal high damage, or bosses being immune to status effects, and having lots of HP and multiple health bars, while dealing comparatively lower damage to players. Player characters and enemies also often have access to completely different mechanics, skills, and status effects. This difference is most obviously apparent when a boss opponent becomes a playable character and vice versa. They function completely differently because they are now operating under different gameplay rules. Video games typically balance player characters and game enemies differently because the ability for humans to think and adapt 
far outperforms the game's limited AI if both share the same game rules. Think of it as if you are in two separate Mario Kart races, one against live online players and another against exclusively CPU players. Live players can drive in varied and unpredictable ways, whereas CPU players are restricted to a few set behavior patterns and thus are ordinarily rather easy to overcome. Hence why, to compensate for this, Mario Kart cheats by making the CPUs rubber band and dynamically change an acceleration to keep pace with the human players, letting them serve as a viable threat. However, because people naturally dislike being placed in unfair situations or given unfair treatment, games need to hide these discrepancies and make it appear that the player and enemies are all playing by the same rules. Pokemon is rather unique among RPG games in that it is unusually fair by game standards. In all main series games, opponents operate by the exact same gameplay rules as the player, with the sole exception being that wild Pokemon can be captured. Both the player and opponent trainers have a maximum team size of 6 Pokemon each, can switch, equip and use items, and construct teams out of the same pool of Pokemon. Even the most difficult of opponents such as Cynthia are all still bound by these rules. This is the key reason why Pokemon is both highly accessible and also quite easy. The player can do everything that the in-game opponents can do and vice versa. Except the player has a huge advantage in this because they are, well, a living thinking human being. In fact, there is absolutely nothing stopping a player from replicating any in-game trainer's exact team and just being better than them at it. So, after 20 years of Pokemon games playing fair, we, as players, have gotten very used to it. All trainer battles, no matter how difficult they could possibly be, still fall within a range of reasonable expectations which have been established across multiple games. Which is why Giratina comes as such a huge surprise to every single player. After you've beaten Legend Arceus' strongest trainer, you think you've won and enter a state of relief or celebration, only for Volo to promptly break the game's rules and call in Giratina as a 7th Pokemon to continue the fight. Volo and Giratina are unique among Pokemon bosses because they effectively cheat the rules of the franchise. They are the first and thus far only instance of an in-game trainer opponent breaking the 6 Pokemon per team limit rule, giving them an artificial, unfair advantage over the player. Volo and Giratina aren't simply surpassing or subverting a player's expectations at this point. Volo is outright taking your expectations and breaking them in half over his knee. This is why Volo and Giratina are so memorable and potentially difficult. There exists zero historical precedence for a battle like this making Giratina's arrival into the fight a surprise for everyone. Nobody could predict a fight like this because it just breaks the foundational rules set by the entire franchise. Prior to Legends Arceus, no sane player would ever expect a trainer battle to contain more than 6 Pokemon, for any reason. So you, the player, are completely caught off guard and fight Giratina. And since you weren't expecting a 7th Pokemon, there's a fair possibility you might lose because you opted to finish off Volo's last Pokemon with an attack instead of healing. Or perhaps you were just mentally flustered and make a mistake. Maybe you win the first time or maybe you take the L and run it back again. And that's when the next surprise kicks in. Alright. That what?! Huh? Okay. So a Pokemon fight with three waves. That's normal. Defeat Giratina, and it transforms into its origin form, refilling its health bar and continuing the fight again. 
effectively making Volo's battle into a 6 vs 8 Pokemon match. Also, mechanically, this doesn't count as a new turn. And since you just spent a turn knocking down Giratina's first health bar, it gets to immediately act after transforming, and potentially will KO you in retaliation. So you might once again get caught off guard, put yourself in a bad position to handle the second Giratina health bar, and potentially take another loss. All of the same points I mentioned above regarding the 6 Pokemon team limit rule being broken apply here as well. This is a case of a Pokemon boss with 2 phases and health bars. Again, an unprecedented case for this series and is something which defies player expectations entirely. Now I must clarify, what makes Volo's battle so great isn't its difficulty. Too often, players tend to believe that games need to be difficult to be fun, but in reality, that isn't always the case at all. The fun of games doesn't come from them being difficult, but instead, them being challenging. And oftentimes, one of the best ways for a game designer to challenge players is to subvert or break their expectations in order to surprise them. Volo isn't a difficult fight if you prepare for him. The game's battle the battle system offers the player a lot of flexibility if you learn it, and the game world and quests provide you with plenty of resources and overpowered Pokemon such as Darkrai, Cresselia, and Alpha Garchomp which can easily sweep through this battle. It's just that no player would have any rational reason to think to prepare for a Cynthia level opponent and an intentionally unfair 6 vs 8 battle in such an otherwise extremely easy and fair game. That, in a nutshell, explains precisely why Volo's battle is hailed as one of the series' best. It isn't because he's objectively difficult, but because he's objectively surprising, and thus both challenging and fun. By this point, Pokemon has been around for over 20 years, and many players have seen almost everything the series has to offer us. Nothing surprises us anymore, and yet Volo manages to surprise us not once, not twice, but three times, both in terms of him as a character and as a battler. His reveal as the game's villain defies the narrative structure of the story. His difficult battle using a variation of Cynthia's team defies the low difficulty level of the rest of the game. And Giratina's involvement as his 7th and 8th Pokemon defies the illusion of fairness which the series had otherwise steadfastly maintained for several years. And that feeling of surprise is something that we, as Pokemon players, haven't really felt in some time. By Breaking the expectations established by both the game's story and the battling rules across the entire franchise, the game's designers turned the battle against Volo into a series of unexpected curveballs and surprises, creating one of the most memorable and outright fun challenges in all of Pokemon. And at the end of the day, that pretty much is what games are all about, aren't they? Having fun. Well. That's a wrap for this duology of videos, I certainly hope you've enjoyed them. Tell me, what was your own experience with fighting against Volo? What were you thinking and feeling as each stage of the battle progressed? I get the feeling that this video made for a somewhat surprising and unexpected take for some of you. So please, I invite you to share your opinions, thoughts and experience with everyone else in the comments below. Leave me a like if you enjoyed the video. And if you haven't watched it already, go check out my video about the game design and player psychology involved in Cynthia's battles. It'll add some additional context onto the points I made for Volo. I look forward to seeing you there.